Council and the viewing audience. Welcome to the presentation of Mayor John Cooper's proposed fiscal year 2021 operating budget, the 57th annual budget for Metropolitan Nashville. And now, with no further ado, Mayor John Cooper. Well, thank you, Mike. This is a conversation with the Council, and I want to thank them and everyone else who is listening in. And I particularly want to thank Kevin Crumbo, Kristen Wilson, and Mary Jo Wigginton, and everyone in Metro Finance, Talia, Kim, Tom, Fred, Phil. This is the most difficult year and the most difficult budget. It's about three budgets in one, and instead of five months to prepare, this has all been done in the last month. We are only 36 days into the Safer at Home order. Now, tens of thousands have lost their jobs here in Nashville. 50,000 people across the country have lost their lives. The safer at home order appears to be working, but we're a long way from being out of the woods. The financial challenges from the virus to everyone is enormous. But we will get through this and to the other side. Now to do that will be the full challenge. Over the next 15 months, the city will miss almost a half a billion dollars in revenue. The cash balance of the city will be driven down to almost zero, and there is no federal bailout to the city. We also need to be able to respond if there's another outbreak. Now, management response to the crisis is saving the city more than $230 million. But even with these actions, there is no way of not sharply increasing property taxes to replace more than $300 million in missing revenue. This will be the greatest financial challenge that this city or any other American city, for that matter, has faced in our lifetimes. Now, what are we able to do? We're able to keep education stable, to keep public safety and health stable, and to avoid layoffs of employees, to replenish our missing cash reserves, and to have the city ready to get back to business as soon as possible. Deep cuts to service and mass layoffs would set the city back for years, and that's not what is best at this time. Now, what are we not able to do? We're not able to pay our employees more. Steps, longevity, open range, or adding funding for neighborhood investments. In a time when so many have lost their jobs, we can't increase pay to our employees, unfortunately. We can't spend the money on capital projects right now that we would like to. And how do we get to a balanced budget? Slow down, cut back, trim, slice, and save. In part, by cutting everything discretionary by 50%. Arts grants, job grants, nonprofits that can't qualify for the Federal CARES Act. The Barnes Fund already took a cut and will be left at $10 million. If you on the Council identify anything that is truly discretionary and has not been cut by 50 percent, let us know and we will prioritize that. Any less effort is unfair to our property taxpayers. And if you on the Council are not willing to raise property tax rates substantially, let us know, and we will have to begin mass layoffs. There is no other way. We will end the quarter with an almost zero cash balance, and we have to have a cash reserve to re withstand another shock. Our cash reserves must get back to what the law and policy requires to be a resilient city. Now, to our educators and public safety officers and employees, know how valued you are. This city and its taxpayers and this council is going through a lot, frankly, to support you. But you are the priority of this budget. And I predict that thousands of other cities will not be so determined. We look forward to getting our city into another era, an era of improvements and not just struggling so to achieve continuity, of just trying to hold things together. Now, the slideshow that we're going to go on to will go over the math of how deep the hole is that we are in and how we can get out. It is complex. And as we go through the complexities, know the work that the Finance Department has had to put in during this last 30 days to get us a state of, val of balance and of resiliency. So for those of you that have the slideshow and for these, everybody looking at home, let's begin. Now, the first slide is our goal, stability amid crisis, and it is a difficult time, but our frontline employees are putting themselves at risk every day to deliver essential services, and we need to support them.
but a lot of cities are going to have to have layoffs, which we in Nashville are going to try our best to avoid. Now, in the second slide, begins to get into some of the work ahead. We need a response, and we need, we need to show that we can respond. Now, we had difficulties beginning with this. We have at $70 million worth of non-recurring and reserve depletion that we had to replace. But this disaster quarter, and we'll get into this in a moment, we'll leave Metro with a fund balance of only $12 million at the end, not enough for a city our size. However, we're projected to lose $470 million in revenue over a 16-month time frame. Next year's net revenue loss of $216 million alone would be devastating to many cities. Now, management actions are going to produce over $234 million in savings, reductions, and deferrals. Now, this budget will include a property tax increase of $1 to cover a $332 million shortfall. That's going to go to cash, the FY21 revenue losses, and a slight amount to have a continuation of effort budget in Metro. Now, this is a crisis budget. It's not, there's nothing discretionary in this budget. And as we go through it, we'll see the severity of the actions that were taken to keep us together during this time of crisis. Now, the first section in this presentation is going to be divided into different sections. There's a little bit of the background to the crisis. And with that, let's just review where we have been as a city. So the pre-crisis -cri Nashville, our fund balance, this is according to Moody's, was already the lowest among peer cities. For those of you looking at this chart, all the way over on the left is Nashville, Tennessee, with the lowest amount of cash reserves of any city reported on by Moody's in this exhibit. That left us vulnerable. Now, in this next slide, you see that we knew these problems, and with Kevin Crumbo's help, we were able to get to a balanced budget for the city, working with the controller this past fall. But we were hoping that the budget ahead was going to be able to repair some of the holes that had been identified and kind of a little bit papered over in the last budget. But we got there. We had a balanced budget, but it already identified that we were in a very difficult financial situation. And then the next slide, we had the EF3 tornado. And this slide, and I just want to compliment finance and particularly Mary Jo Wigginton, um, what was the cost of the tornado? Our best efforts at estimating this is that the estimated cost is $40 million. Now, we had an excellent insurance policy, and you have money from FEMA. We're hoping to get $20 million from insurance. $6 million has already been received, and then TEMA is going to hopefully contribute $15 million so that at the end, the city of Nashville will be out about $5 million for the tornado. However, that is in time. In time, we will receive money to help Metro. Now, people have been devastated by it, and individuals have suffered terribly, but the city of Metro, this is estimated to be the financial effect of the tornado. And then in this third item, and kind of the background of, of where we are in the crisis, is COVID-19, which is unprecedentedly devastating to a city's sales tax revenues. Now, the rest of this book presentation will mostly be about COVID-19 and its effect on the cities. We have begun to respond, but the slides ahead will show in more detail where that response is coming from. Now, if we come to the next section, how we get through the crisis, Q4. This is the beginning of our difficult journey. This current fiscal quarter in FY20 is going to be the worst in Metro history. And let's examine a little bit when we turn the page into Q4 about how we're getting there. Now, we will have in one quarter a $216 million revenue shortfall. That, that is a lot. That's happening right now. It is a shortfall. Budgets are supposed to be balanced, and all of a sudden, in the last quarter of this fiscal year, we're coming up $216 million short. And it's sudden. As we've all experienced with Safer at Home, this recession is brutally sudden. Well, what did we do? 
In the next slide, how we're getting through Q4, management has responded. The city has responded, and we've saved $124 million by actions right now to kind of get this plane landed. So you start out with um, $216 million worth of missing revenue, and you have a management city response aided by the council and our finance department. We're saving $124 million, but we cannot save the whole $260 million. What happens? And the next slide will tell you our hit to cash is $92 million. To get us through this quarter, we've had to use our cash account, our savings account, to $92 million. That's going to leave us with only $12 million by the end of the quarter. Now, $12 million for a city of this size is essentially nothing. And also, we don't know what's ahead. So I think you have to assume that it's essentially leaving us with a, a zero cash balance. But if you go through the columns, revenues and their effect, then column two, operating expenses, $124 million worth of reductions and savings that, that the city administration has put together to lower the effect of this quarter, you're still out $92 million, which, again, we already had a cash level, if you remember the early slide, which was the smallest of any major city, and here we've lost our remaining cash balance in this quarter. It's leaving us with very few options. So if we go to the next section, which is called the revenue crisis, let's go back to the big picture of the problem that's ahead of us. The, the big, the overarching problem of getting us through safely to the other side. And that, with this slide, and we'll begin to slow down a little bit and take our time. With only 12 million in reserves, Metro revenues will be off $472 million between Q4 and FY21. That is, that's almost exactly our entire sales tax collections on a city that has become somewhat dependent on sales tax collections. And re sales taxes represent about a third of our tax base. But that's the number that I know people have been asking and finance has been calculating that we currently think that COVID is going to cost us, and that's $472 million. Again, we identified the tornado impact, and some of that tornado does affect metro revenues. It's not all just the $40 million in cost, but the dominant effect here is on COVID. And if we turn the page, the $472 million challenge is not the only extent of kind of the funding challenge for Metro. If you remember, we still had $70 million left over from the previous year. That's a series of non-recurring revenue that was booked as recurring revenue, and then a series of kind of taking from operating reserves one-time money that we pretended was recurring money. All of that in the end has to be paid back, and that ends up being about $70 million. So between the $70 million and the stratospheric loss of $472 million from the quarter and the fiscal year, you're really ending up looking for $540 million in revenue to get us back to a completely balanced budget. Well, that is the revenue crisis. Now, the next slide answers a question that everybody has asked and has been a disappointing answer for Nashville. There is no cavalry coming to the rescue. The federal funding that is available to Nashville, either directly or through the state, are subject to three rules. It has to be spent this year and in a COVID response, but it cannot replace anything that has been in your budget. It cannot replace anything that's on your budget, which in the end means that the federal government, wanting to be helpful, still put everything on too high a shelf, and we're not able to reach it. There will be some COVID help to the budget, but not fundamental help in a city that, frankly, is having to figure out how to pay for about a half a billion dollars worth of, worth of need. So there is no cavalry to the rescue. And off to how do you get it done in the FY21 budget. So if you turn the slide again, we're now on to the FY21 budget overview. 
wow, the most difficult budget in Metro history. FY20 was, um, a, you know, was passed by no one in the council voting for it. It had kind of a $70 million missing hole. It um, uh, was balanced late through the help of our finance department working with the controller. Then you had this horrific quarter, and now the year ahead. Now, in the FY21 budget, it's a crisis budget, and there's some guiding principles that we need to carefully go through. It's emergent res emergency response is our highest priority. Replenishing cash is a high priority. If we don't, we risk our ability to serve the public and respond to the kind of crisis that's going on right now. Now, we're going to use every resource we can particularly federal and state assistance. We're going we're gonna to try to get some help from them, and we'll get a little bit of help on the edges. But our goal is to maintain continuity of effort for our services to ensure that Nashville emerges from this crisis stronger and manage budget cuts that exist in balance with what will be a sharp tax increase. Now, the next slide begins to show how we're working the problem. And again, Mary Jo's leadership, we're grateful to. Federal funds may be used to improve our COVID response, but not to close the budget gap. So in some cases, we're going to be able to have a federal CARES Act funding for things that can be a COVID response. And she is helping steward us through getting the most use of those resources and to supplement our budget and to cover costs that can legitimately be classified as a COVID response. It's very valuable. It's not going to make up for hundreds of millions of dollars, but it will be valuable, and I'm grateful to her efforts in making this happen for the city. Now, what happens specifically in FY21 in terms of lost revenues? This is a $280 million total loss to the city and its revenues. But now we are working the problem, and we've been working the problem of how to reduce the $280 million worth of lost revenues, and we are doing it by $64 million of increased revenues. This is part of the management response to working the problem to lessen the blow to taxpayers in helping to have us have a balanced budget. This $64 million, each item is itemized on the table to the right. Now, the $280, we're grateful, becomes $216, but $216 is still a huge amount of revenue to figure out how to replace. Now, we also, as we identified earlier in Q4, we have almost no cash balance. So if we go through this slide, and all these slides, by the way, are, will be available on the on the web page. We have to replace this $100 million that got us through Q4. So you have the $216 million worth of net revenue loss from FY21 that we have to replace, and then we have to replace the $100 million from Q4. The $100 million, let me be precise, does add by five and really by eight, a slight adjustment. There's three more million going back into the Metro Public Schools Fund to get closer to a 5% policy and to move that up with just a little bit more headroom, and then to establish a $5 million rainy day fund. The rainy day fund would have an effect, is the same size as our net out of pocket for the tornado. So having it be that kind of size of rainy day fund seems completely prudent. But we've got 216 from FY21 that you have to replace, now 100 that you have to replace. What other costs are we going to have in our FY21 budget? And that comes to the next page, which is this budget will cost at a continuity of needs effort is $16 million. Now, the $16 million we're going to spend in a whole other section of the slideshow to show where the $16 million comes from. But ultimately, remember these three components, the $216 million to get us through FY21 of the missing revenue, net of a lot of increased revenue that we found for the problem. 
$100 million of cash replenishment because we have to have a cash balance going forward, and now $16 million to have a continuity of effort budget in FY21. Those three numbers add together, if you come to the next page, this is the COVID hole. This is $322 million, and it's comprised of the first column of the missing $216 million in FY21 revenue, the $100 million in the middle column that you're going to need to replenish your cash to have a resilient city to face the challenges going ahead, and we're going to need $16 million to get us through FY21 in a continuity of needs budget. That's adding to $332 million. If you wanted to say how much did COVID cost the city, this would be a relatively accurate number with all the other management adjustments taken aside, all the other things that finance and the operating officer of the city is going through to, to reduce the financial effect on the city that in the end, because we have to have a balanced budget, the taxpayers are going to have to be putting up. Now, on the next page is a chilling slide. How much worse can it be? So if there are different scenarios for COVID, and we're still under a safer at home order, and we were hoping every day that we can move into a phased rollout and a restart of our economy, here's the answer to the question of can it be worse, and if so, how much worse? And from what is proposed in this budget, how bad can it be? And you see slower than expected recovery period, that could be between 20 and $40 million of additional effect. And say there was a late fall secondary spike in COVID, that could be as much as an additional $110 million. This is why restoring the $100 million worth of cash balance that we use to get us through this current quarter is absolutely essential. This is how we're going to be resilient, is have the ability to withstand another shock of significant severity. Now, if we had a shock that is greater than that for some reason, then frankly, the budget that we're putting forward would be in jeopardy, and we would have to resort to brutal things such as layoffs. But we're trying to navigate in a continuity of effort way a path where that's not required, where we are a resilient city, and we're ready for when we restart the economy to be back to work, to have the level of city services that we need to have, to be the city that responds the quickest and the best to the other side of COVID. But this chilling slide shows that as all of our calculations can be put under a remarkable stress due to just the course of events. And again, if there's, it's hard to raise taxes on people where a lot of that use goes back to cash, but this is why you have to have the cash available in order to respond. Now the next section that we come through is how we get through the crisis budget. This is the hard choices that get us to FY21. Really, if you're footing this to the back of the presentation, this is where does the $16 million in net operating costs come from. We explored in the Q4 discussion why the $100 million is necessary. That cash is what got us through the quarter and it has to be replaced. We've explored with the revenue crisis, the missing revenue in FY21 which is net $216 million after a pretty robust management response to increase revenues and to decrease costs. But let's unbundle for a moment the $16 million choice that's in the FY21 budget. And that's comprised of really four numbers, and we'll lead, go through this one number at a time. The continuity of service needs for the FY21 budget actually is $57 million more. There are a lot of things, such as a water rate increase. Um, there's some continuity of service. There are contracts that have to be honored. You can't just go to zero to run a government. You have contracts and obligations that you're going to have to honor. Um, you can cut them way back, and we have, but that number of just glide path for the government, even in this minimum way, is $57 million. Now, in the next page, there's part of the 
non-discretionary aspect of spending in government, which I want to spend a little bit of time on, which is that there will still need to be an additional $6 million in debt service. Now, frankly, this budget is postponing the big number by slowing our capital spending down. And that is about $40 million that would have been required in a normal budget if we were back to normal as usual. But the reality is by delaying and deferring those costs, we're saving in this operating budget $40 million. But we do have some debt service cost, and that is this number of $16 million. So $57 million required for continuity of service plus $6 million feels like a need of $64 million for the budget going forward. Well, what did we do? One is we've turned to our great team and we're figuring out how to get federal money for $27 million of that. And that's a fantastic thing, particularly this is true in transportation where the federal response is allowing a continuity of service standard, which allows us to have a larger amount of federal money being used for transportation, really than for any other service in Metro. And we're grateful for that, but let's just check back that you've got the 57, right, that you started out, plus the six for debt service, that gets you to 64, but now we're paying, we're finding $27 million of that out of the federal response, and then on to the next slide, which is a super hard slide and one of the hardest slides that any of us on the council will ever see, which is that the hard choices had to be made on discretionary spending, and that's producing $21 million worth of savings. Now, there's a rule in here, which I alluded to early on, which is half. If it's discretionary, it's a cut of half. And this is affecting things that no one ever wanted or felt probably would be cut in half. These economic development grants, the $500 job grants to companies, reduced by half. Chamber payments, reduced by half. Nashville grad, reduced by half. Now, there is a, the elimination, sadly, of the Community Education Commission, but I hope that those employees can be repurposed within Metro, but in the end, Hard, hard decisions have to be made. Among the hardest is longevity pay. In keeping with our doctrine that discretionary money is reduced by half and we cannot pay our valued, valued employees more, at this time we can't do steps, longevity pay, um, or open range pay. We're just trying to avoid layoffs and keep things exactly where they are and frankly, as you go through this budget, that's a super hard thing to do. But this is $21 million worth of discretionary savings by applying a rule that it's just half. It has to be half. Everybody is sacrificing in this budget. Now, in the next slide reveals some of the pain in this, which is costs not included in the budget, such as employee pay such as further debt service and other negotiated savings, there is a lot in here that we would like to do and would be doing in a normal year, where we could find revenue increases and put them directly into employee pay. But what we're doing right now is having, how hard is it just to have a strict continuity of service approach to the budget this year? So. Let's spend a little bit of time on our conclusion slides because I think in balance you'll, I'm trying to be, to provide the strategic answer for how the city gets to the next place, how with hundreds of millions of dollars of missing revenue and spending in the next few months really, how possibly can this city or any city get back to that? So the first slide in this, and this is the, kind of the conclusion section. And let's review for a second. Is management actions, both in the quarter and in the year ahead, really are resulting in a minimum of $234 million worth of savings, of reductions, of additional revenue. Management action is coming up with, I predict before this is over, to a quarter of a billion dollars. This was once an unthinkable number for a city in such a short period of time, and I'm grateful to everyone helping to implement this. 
and to have these savings consistent with our overall goals of continuity of service, of not really touching education, public safety, public health, to provide a response from the front lines that, that we will have plenty of money to be able to do that. So I just want to thank everybody who has worked so hard on this and the general question to the public of how you, can you increase taxes. Well, one of the reasons you can increase taxes is that we have really shared the pain and the pain is coming from the government and in the end there's a minimum of, of $234 million worth of management action savings money and in the end there will be more. Now the next slide is a general slide, is the sources and uses. I often think that this is the easiest way to get a hold of a complicated financial matter, is the sources and uses. And this is pretty streamlined, but I think it begins to tell the story of what we are proposing. All right, so under sources and uses, uses, we have the adjustments from the current fiscal year. You had were the money that we had to replace coming through the unbalanced budget. That ended up being about $70 million once you replace the operating reserves, such as things like our lawsuit reserve, um, our disability reserves. That ended up being about $70 million, as well as the one-time sales that were booked as recurring revenue. Then you've got the missing Q4 revenue of $192 million, which we reviewed in the early section. Then you have the huge effect from FY21, the $208 million of just overall missing revenue, and then the net cost of the continuity of service budget, and then what we discussed is a little bit of improvement in our cash balances at the end of this. That's a $566 million effect. That's the uses, what are the sources? The sources are $234 million of management actions, which I hope will round up. But also you see the need for this large, sharp, difficult tax increase of $332 million to get to the $566 million of sources in order to have a balanced budget. Now, in a one table, this probably represents best to me the journey that we've been on financially as a city to get safely to the other side through our unbalanced budget, through the tornado, and through COVID. And the management actions at this, we welcome input and how to make them greater. But right now, this is what it pencils in, and that's why the tax increase is as large as it is at $332 million. Now, if we come to the next slide, that 332, we showing you again where that comes from. Revenue losses of $216 million from FY21. The $100 million that we lost in order to get us through the quarter and to get our cash reserves back to kind of our minimum to being able to be a resilient city. And then $16 million worth of cash, even once you come through the continuation of service, the increased contract amounts that people need to have, minus the federal funding that we're hoping to be able to get, uh, and the cuts in the discretionary spending. That's adding up to $332 million, and that ends up being a dollar increase and the property tax. At one point, I know many people in the council had welcomed the idea of a property tax in order to fund community priorities. And it is devastating to have the property tax go back to get us through the COVID crisis. But that is noble work. Our community will never be more challenged than it is right now with all these people out of work and depending on an effective government to make sure that there is a safety net. In the next slide, here's the dollar increase. It's a rate of 415. It's a shock. I think we've built the case of how large the revenue need is, but 415 is still lower than any of the other big four cities in Tennessee. And frankly, over the last 25 years, our property tax rate in, Natura, in Nashville has averaged 
$4.30. So we were always ready way below what average weight has been in the past, and no one has ever really accused Nashville of being a high-tax environment. That's been one of our competitive advantages that we weren't. And we we're still able to be a lower tax city than other cities and lower than our historic average. And frankly, just five years ago, the rate was $4.54. So having it at 4.15, where five years ago it was at 4.54, that's still a decrease from where we had been previously. It's an enormous increase, but it is absolutely necessary to get us through this COVID moment. And all of us in the council are waiting to where we can get beyond COVID to build a city of improvements and an era of improvements as opposed to simply responding. Now in the last budget, and I'm grateful to Kevin and his expert team being here, the technical matter is that our budget will be filed at 2447489500. And it will be balanced because we have to have a balanced budget. We cannot print money. We cannot borrow money. And frankly, with Kevin's help and direction, we're not using slightly dodgy budget techniques in any of this going forward. We're not rating funds. We're not sliding expenses with the exception maybe that the debt service payment was, we've pushed that out a year, but we were doing that because frankly, we're slowing capital spending down and we're allowed to do it. In another, and don't pay that bill until it becomes due, frankly, but in another era, all of us are gonna welcome having these basic budget reforms so that this city does not get back into kind of the pre-crisis status that we were in of kind of living off of budget practices in order to have uh, um, insufficient revenues and kind of gaming the revenue number. This budget does not use fund balance in any way to balance itself. That's the first time since 2013 that that's true. That's a big statement. This budget does not use any fund balance. Now, in part, we have no funds to use for that, um, but that's part of the reason of how Metro got into a little bit of trouble that it did in the past, and it ends up um, learning, responding, being resilient, and having a plan. Now, this is a complicated analysis. I urge everyone to go back through it and look at the biggest components of this presentation. One is the Q4 loss. How big is it and how we paid for it? We paid for it by a lot of management action, but frankly, that's too big. You can't pay for it just with management action. It had to be using our thin cash balance down to the point where it's, it concerns me every day where it is. The second part of this is the overall revenue crisis. The overall revenue picture, it's Q4, it's the residual FY20 needed, needs to be funding, it's Q4, which is the $100 million of missing, missing cash, and then FY21 of working the problem but still needing $216 million to get you through that. What are our values here? Our values are to serve our employees. We are disappointed and sad that they are not having step increases or longevity pay raises or, or open range. Of course we would like them to be paid better and coming into this, we're hoping that there can be hazard pay from them, basically funded by the federal government. But keeping our new spending needs and continuity of service in the environment of a dollar tax increase as thin as possible, I believe is our obligation. And this is a shared pain budget, and it does do about three budgets in one, and I am grateful to finance for their incredible job in pulling this together and showing everybody that lives in Davidson County that we can do it. We can make the hard choices. We can get this balanced and we can move ahead with a platform that is ready to have a great city going forward. And nothing is gonna be more exciting to me or to the people on the council to get to that day. 
where we can go back to building sidewalks and police precincts and have body cameras and have a better layer of pay and to have our teachers be the best paid in the state of Tennessee. But today, what's required is to getting us through the current crisis. With that, I want to thank you and I appreciate having this conversation with the council. And for all of you at home who are listening into this conversation, I appreciate your help in getting Nashville through this crisis. And remember, please stay safer at home. It is your response that will allow us to withdraw the order and to get the economy restarted. And the moment the economy restarts, everything, including the Metro budget itself, will be considerably easier. Thank you very much. And with this, I want to turn it over to our marvelous finance director, Kevin Crumbo. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Cooper. I think uh, Mayor Cooper summed up a moment ago the uh, complexity of the information that uh, is going to comprise this budget. And uh, we find ourselves in a bit of an unusual place here in terms of processes uh, that we're following for this budget relative to years gone by. Uh, my understanding is that traditionally that the uh, mayor has delivered a state of metro address and has had the opportunity in, in the moments to introduce the budget for the year ahead. And then in a meeting like this, uh, the uh, finance uh, director will come and uh, provide the details behind that and uh, really start to educate the council of the details that are in that budget. Uh, of course, this year again is a bit unusual, and so the mayor is elected to uh, be here today to present those on his own uh, to uh, bring forward a great number of slides and a great deal of data. So in turn, and to make sure that our uh, time here together is productive, uh, the traditional slides that many of you on the council are used to and those of you who are new would become, I think, uh, accustomed to uh, that the financial uh, team has normally put together. Uh, we will be posting all of those to our website a little bit later today. Uh, that way we can avoid the information overload really here uh, for this session. And so for the remaining time we have, I've prepared a few remarks. Uh, I particularly want to touch on a few points that Mayor Cooper had asked me to uh, reinforce about the presentation that he He's given. Uh, when I'm finished, I'm going to invite Mary Jo Wiggins uh, to the podium here to talk very specifically about the CARES uh, Act, some of the funding uh, relief that uh, Mayor Cooper uh, referred to. And then he's also referred to uh, our ever looming uh, burden of debt, our bonds, and so forth. And so our treasurer, Tom Edelman, is here to uh, talk uh, in more detail about that. Uh, once we conclude, I think there may be a little bit of time left for questions. Uh, I'm sure there will be an enormous amount of questions in the week ahead. And so our plan is to uh, go about a council uh, process that I think has been sent to all of you. Uh, Budget and Finance Chair Mendez has uh, laid out uh, quite a healthy uh, calendar there. Uh, so there will be lots of time in the weeks ahead to, uh, to work through the many details that uh, Mayor Cooper has talked about. Uh, so with that, again, I've got some prepared prepared remarks to make sure I don't miss anything. And uh, let me start by saying that, you know, shortly after Mayor Cooper took office last fall, he asked if I would step away from my own business and community projects and serve the first portion of his administration and help stabilize Metro's financial uh, position as it is, uh, I'm sorry, it was then, and really set the course for sustainability. And among his near-term goals at that point were resolving a multitude of conflicts with the State Comptroller's Office and taking steps to maintain an investment-grade rating uh, for our sizable bond debt. Um, a lower rating could be troublesome since it could reduce access to capital markets and uh, over the long term increase our interest rates before Metro uh, could really find ways to increase cash and fund balances uh, on its own. Um, as Mayor Cooper mentioned, those balances have thinned over the last few years as Metro has invested in its operations and invested in capital projects uh, to meet the needs of our growing community. And unfortunately, though, uh, Metro to this point has not raised enough revenue to pay for all those investments uh, over that same period of time and to uh, cover the cash needs uh, that we have out of our general fund and our school funds and so forth that Mayor Cooper described, uh, we've actually had to borrow from other funds of the Metro government so that we actually don't run out of cash in those, uh, in those funds. And we'll be talking a lot more about those details uh, in the weeks ahead. I know it's very confusing when we talk about cash balances versus fund balances and the many fund balances that really make up the Metro government. So um, I'll be back uh, to you, the council, to get in more of those details weeks uh, ahead. 
so what's really happened? Uh, we've been very fortunate. Uh, we've enjoyed some uh, good success uh, up to this point. And what I mean by that is that we were first successful in resolving conflicts with the Comptroller's Office. Uh, the council will recall that Comptroller Wilson addressed you in November and simply put, he warned that Metro's financial position was not stable then. Um, he had not and would not approve Metro's prevailing budget and warned of some dire consequences if Metro did not take corrective actions. I'm delighted to report today that in the midst of uh, all the conditions that Mayor Cooper described, that corrective action plan has been completed and we are now in good standing uh, with the Comptroller's Office. Second, we have been successful in maintaining Metro's investment uh, rating for its bonds. Uh, last week, uh, Moody's, uh, one of the prevailing rating agencies, uh, renewed our, our rating, investment grade rating. And they really did that with the expectation that we are going to see our way through this crisis, uh, that we are going to do a good job and be prudent uh, fiscal managers throughout. Uh, but Moody's, too, cautioned that the rating may decline in the future if Metro doesn't take steps to improve the cash and fund balances. Uh, Moody's full reports uh, available online, um, and we, uh, we may post that to our website. We've been uh, talking a bit about uh, whether we can do that or not, but one way or another, we'll try to make that available to the public. Uh, but its full report uh, outlines further uh, financial strengths and, and weaknesses of the Metro government. And uh, I believe, though, that the cash and fund balance is the most important things in that report to point out to you today. So we've been successful in achieving those near-term goals, but we now face the many challenges of the tornadoes and the COVID crisis that uh, the mayor has just described. And I believe the budget that he is proposing now is a thoughtful one. It's a reasonable approach to addressing the, uh, the challenges at hand here. And like so many other cities around the globe, though, we struggle. We struggle with many questions about our financial future. And uh, questions like how can we accurately forecast revenue declines now and hopefully recoveries in the future when we're just a few weeks into this historic era. Other questions on the other side, how can we implement countermeasures such as the reductions to our spending on operations and capital projects when the needs of the public we serve are changing during this crisis and will change again in the course of a recovery? And there's so many other questions that come to my mind. I'm sure they come to yours as well. But all in, for this budget, I believe we must follow the wise saying that we need to plan for the worst, but we need to hope for the best. And of course, we need to do that in a manner that's reasonable and that's practical. Mayor Cooper's already outlined his budget proposal for you. Many opportunities for questions and alternative proposals are already scheduled, as I mentioned before. Um, Council uh, Budget and Finance Chair uh, Mendez and I had a uh, discussion this morning about the schedule ahead. Uh, we plan to talk again tomorrow and start uh, the flow of information with the slides I mentioned and then some other questions he started to ask. So uh, please stay tuned for that, that process to follow. Uh, for today, though, Mayor Cooper has asked me to add to his comments a few of the primary guidelines that we must be mindful if we expect the course uh, for sustainability that I mentioned earlier to come as we get to the other side of this crisis. So first guideline, the budget needs to be balanced by June 30th. Uh, this is the date designated in our Metro Charter, and it is the date the Comptroller's Office is urging local governments to adhere to. Uh, the comptroller would like to receive that budget by mid-June, so uh, those of you that heard me talk about the budget process uh, previously will hear me urging through it that even though we have to June 30, that if we can get that done uh, mid-June to give the comptroller ample time to review that, that we can have a better outcome with that review process and we were able to achieve uh, uh, last year in the, uh, in the prior administration. Uh, so more to follow about that timing. Uh, but as a general theme, uh, the comptroller's office is encouraging local governments governments to make their best estimates of revenues, make their best countermeasures, and use what is known today about the ultimate impact of the COVID crisis and implement those countermeasures and then closely monitor your actual results in the next few months. Uh, and they know that the budgets can be amended later in the year if our actual results turn out better or worse than we're predicting really at this time with the information in our hands. So June 30th is the uh, target, but hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to get something done before that. Uh, the second guideline, the budget should be structurally balanced, and the simple meaning of that is the recurring revenues are sufficient to meet the recurring obligations, including our debt service. Third guideline, the budget should include a maintenance of effort for our metro schools as required by state law. 
This is a complex topic, and simply put, it requires that local governments like ours establish budgets each year for schools that equal or exceed the year before. And there are adjustments um, for enrollments and a few other factors, but by and large, year over year, we need to see the school's budget stay the same uh, or increase in the year ahead. Uh, the mayor's budget proposal meets this requirement and is essentially a flat budget from this year to next year. This, of course, is not the budget that the administration was building before the COVID crisis, but quite frankly, it's the one that we can afford to do now. Uh, regrettably, a large portion of our sales tax revenue and our related cash receipts dedicated to schools will not be received due to the crisis. So between now and the time we can replace that cash flow with property tax cash flow, Metro Schools must reduce its spending. Dr. Battle and her team have already begun to do so, and they will be sharing the details with the school board in due course. So I'll be careful here today not to jump in front of them, but we are truly grateful for their tremendous collaboration. They've been marvelous partners to work with these last few weeks as we think through uh, their worst case scenario. And uh, a lot will be built into that, including what needs to be happened today for the events that have already happened, as well as planning for what happens if COVID and other events may return uh, in the future. And um, I don't envy the many challenges they have as they think about our, our school children and the many uh, folks who work in schools to educate them. Uh, so we're very thankful for their cooperation and, and helping us through this, this tough time. Fourth budget guideline, uh, we need to establish those balances in keeping with Metro's financial policies, or at least be on a clear path to do so, even during this crisis. And Mayor Cooper did a nice job of explaining the logic behind that. Uh, but in general, a portion of our policies are to maintain a 5% minimum in our general fund and our school funds. Uh, the mayor's budget reaches that minimum for the general fund, and it's just a little under for the metro schools. However, the metro schools uh, is expecting to receive millions in relief monies that will hopefully make its overall position similar to the general fund uh, in a short period of time. And so significant details about that relief funding have not been released by the uh, other governments yet. So we'll be keeping a close eye on those and continue to work with Dr. Battle and her team as we learn uh, more about that. Um, there are strong arguments for increasing the fund balances well beyond what Mayor Cooper has described. Uh, prior to the tornadoes and the COVID crisis, the mayor and the comptroller had warned that the Metro did not have rainy day funds. Uh, some local governments include so-called rainy day monies within their general fund. Others establish a dedicated fund. And essentially, Metro has had neither of those in recent years and has relied on its ability to borrow across its many other funds to operate normally as well as through this crisis. That's how we're able to come up with the, the cash that it takes to run each day, even though our cash balances run so thin on the general fund and uh, the school fund and so forth that Mayor Cooper uh, described earlier. And so... Uh, we've got to replenish those, and um, what we are planning to do is um, establish um, those fund balances as well as an additional dedicated fund to rainy days. Uh, $5 million. Uh, that $5 million, I believe, is a step in the right direction for us to say that we're not only committed to minimum fund balances and working our way through this crisis, but uh, we will uh, take that step and uh, really be committed in the future to hopefully growing that, uh, that fund by itself so that we don't have to fall back on the, uh, on the fund balances that are already uh, so thin for us. There are more guidelines for budgeting that my team will be discussing with the council in the course of its deliberations. I hope this summary has been a good starting point. And so to wrap up, I'd like to join the mayor in thanking the dedicated team that's prepared this budget despite the difficult conditions. And like so many other organizations, our finance department has faced a lot of disruption due to this crisis. The health of our staff and our loved ones, remote working arrangements, limited functionality and access to our normal business tools, and of course, the lack of day-to-day -day personal interactions sufficient for workflow and problem solving, not only within our department, but across other uh, portions of the government as well. I'm joined here today in person by two veterans of Metro Finance, and the strength of this budget would not be possible without their knowledge and experience. And first, I'd like to recognize our current budget director, Kim McDonald, whose hard driving, no excuses leadership style has inspired us every day, and quite frankly, every night for the last few weeks. 
and our incoming budget director, Tom Edelman, who has been a longtime Metro treasurer and whose steady hands to this crisis have improved the short-term positions of our debt and successfully placed our recent water and sewer bonds in the marketplace when others seem to be fleeing it. I'm also joined here today by newly appointed finance uh, deputy director, Mary Jo Wiggins. Uh, Mayor Cooper referenced her earlier. Um, she is well known to this community for her leadership of the Red Cross and United Way, and her experience has been just a key success factor in attaining our federal and state relief funds so far. Um, she's now working with several departments and organizations connected to Metro to deploy those funds, and just as soon as guidelines are clarified, we'll start trying to get those deployed as quickly as possible. And finally, partnering with our finance team throughout this budget process has been our Chief Operating Officer, Kristen Wilson. She brings tremendous experience and expertise to Nashville from a similar role in Atlanta. And as we've tackled these many difficult issues together, I've just marveled at her thoughtfulness at every turn. Nashville is fortunate to have stolen her from Atlanta. This team is working on a highly compressed schedule, as you know. Budgets are inherently uh, relying on complex computations, assumptions, and estimates. And we realize the difficulties we have faced in preparing this budget in such a short period increase the possibility of errors along the way. Uh, should you spot any of those in the ordinance that we filed today, the slides that we're about ready to post, and so forth, uh, those come with our apologies. We hope you will quickly point them out to us, and that way we can make any corrections as soon as possible. And likewise, it is our intention to be transparent in our analysis and budgeting, and we hope you will let us know of any topic where we have fallen short on this, and uh, bear with us, and we will try and get information with you uh, as soon as we can. It has been and it will be our goal to inspire the trust and confidence of this council and the public that we serve together in the prudent fiscal management in the days ahead. Thanks for this opportunity to address you today. I look forward to the deliberations uh, with the council providing more information to you. And with that, I'm gonna invite uh, Mary Jo Wiggins to join the podium and explain uh, our relief funding and where we stand with that. Mary Jo. Thank you, Kevin. Um, as you heard earlier from Mayor Cooper, Metro has received $121 million for local government COVID-19 relief. Um, in order for those expenses to be eligible under this CARES Act grant, the expenses must be spent on the preparation for, prevention of, and response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The expenses must not be accounted for in our current FY20 budget, and the expenses must be incurred between March 1st and December 30th of this year. We are grateful for these funds to cover the costs of our efforts, efforts thus far and the expenses we will continue to incur as we fight this pandemic. What the CARES Act fund does not do for us is replace the lost revenue that you heard Mayor Cooper refer to earlier. Those revenues include sales tax, wholesale beer and liquor tax, city and county gas tax, business excise tax, as well as many other activity taxes, fees, and permit revenues. The funds cannot cover expenses we would normally incur in our city's operations, most significantly employee compensation and benefits from Metro employees who are currently working directly on this COVID expense if their salaries were already accounted for in our budget. There are careful restrictions on these funds, and we are hopeful that the federal government will move forward with additional funding for state and local governments that will provide revenue relief. But until then, we will create a full plan to optimize all of the current CARES Act funding available to Metro and its agencies. For example, in addition to the local government relief fund, there is also $26 million available in funding for MNPS to support distance learning for students and for professional training for teachers who are now teaching remotely. There is $75 million for local and regional transit systems to support current operations despite a drop in ridership and available funding. There is $5 million from HUD focused on sheltering and services to our homeless population. We have also identified additional grants opportunities for other Metro departments, such as police, fire, and Metro Action Commission. While these additional grant opportunities are all focused on the COVID relief, we will seek maximum flexibility available in different funding components. We believe some of that flexibility will allow us to fund those nonprofits whose funding was suspended from the fiscal 2021 budget that the mayor has proposed. 
Our intention is to better understand how those specific nonprofits are now serving families, individuals, and students impacted by COVID and provide funding for those cr critical services through the CARES Act Fund. We are reaching out for additional guidance from state and federal authorities. We are also investigating how other cities are planning to use the CARES Act funding. We will take all that we learn into consideration as we move forward with our plan. We will put these funds to work not only within Metro government, but also throughout our community to continue to prevent the spread of the virus and to respond to the COVID crisis impacting so many families, individuals, and businesses. We hope that provides a little more information about what we know of our CARES Act funding today. We will continue to seek more answers and we will answer your questions when those become available to us. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Edelman, our treasurer. Thank you, Mary Jo. I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about some of the points that are, are in the, the debt budget this year, as well as uh, the debt report that will be sent to council later this afternoon. Uh, the annual report will be is, an, is a, uh, a long document that you've been familiar, the council been familiar with getting for the last few years, and it will be available on the website uh, shortly after this, as well as emailed directly to the council members. As mentioned earlier, the debt service budget for FY21 is $343 million, which is 6.2 million more than FY20, and represents about 14% of the budget. Total outstanding general obligation bonds at June 30 will be about $3 billion, with an additional $500 million of commercial paper. Metro's credit rating remains strong. As Kevin mentioned a few minutes ago, on April 21st, Moody's released a report of the annual review of Metro's credit. They confirmed our strong AA rating. They included some strengths, uh, credit strengths that we enjoy as a city. First was the state capital and regional economic center. And second, from prudent financial management. They've uh, commented on that over a number of years of the ability of management to deal with the financial issues and that's extraordinarily present this year as we dealt with these, with these uh, budget issues. Among the credit challenges they issue in their, they mentioned in their report are the thinning reserves and liquidity levels that both Mayor Cooper and Kevin discussed in, in detail. And uh, the, as you saw in, in the mayor's presentation, this, this uh, budget will try to improve on those levels as we go forward. The other issue that they identified is our, our uh, above average debt burden. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Looking over the past 10 years uh, of Metro's outstanding debt, we have shown a growth from $2 billion of outstanding debt in 2011 to about $3.5 billion at the end of this fiscal year. This averages about $150 million increase in outstanding debt over that 10 year period. For fiscal year 20, we will see a principal payoff of about $182 million. So you, you think about that, you think, well, you know, we're, we're reducing the amount of our debt. Well, on top of that, we've also had, to date, $255 million of capital spending. So the two together will result in approximately $100 million of increased debt outstanding as we get through the end of this year. Current projections for our next bond issue is later this year, sometime late in the year. As the mayor mentioned and Kevin mentioned as well, we had originally planned for that budget or for that bond issue to happen late summer, but due to the, uh, the uh, order to reduce spending on capital projects, we've been able to delay that. And now the bond issue will happen uh, later in the year, probably in the November timeframe. There's currently, as I mentioned, $500 million of commercial paper outstanding that we will be uh, spending until that time and then take that, that commercial paper out with the next bond issue. The existing commercial paper program that we've been operating under for a few years expires in July of this year. We have spent the last several weeks negotiating an extension of that program and we'll bring, be bringing a resolution to council in May 
with uh, the results of those efforts and an extension of the program. So we hope that you will consider that carefully and as it comes before you. In fiscal year 21, that will be starting in July 1st, we've already identified some potential bonds that could be eligible for refunding, meaning that we could refinance those bonds for a lower interest rate and reduce our interest payments over the life of those bonds. The uh, potential that we have right now is approximately $7 million. That would be subject, of course, to the interest rates that, that are prevalent if, if they still are, are able to generate those kind of savings when we get to a bond issue. And we would do that issue in conjunction with the uh, issue to take out commercial paper probably in, in late fall, early winter time frame. Another borrowing par part of the budget cycle that, that uh, you will be seeing legislation on are tax anticipation notes, or TANs, which Metro has used over the past two physical years to uh, match our cash flow with our, with our revenue flow. As you're aware, cash receipts do not always match budgeted spending. For example, our property taxes are collected between October and February. However, budgeted spending starts in July. So there's a cash flow difference. That cash flow can be covered by, in a couple of different ways. One, by cash that's available. So if the general fund of the government had cash that carried over into the next year, which is the cash reserve that we've been talking about that's been thin or, or really low, then you could use that cash to get you through until the, uh, until the tax revenue started coming in. Another tool that we have is tax, or the tax anticipation notes, which is a, a state authorized note that we can issue to get cash on hand to cover that, that cash flow difference that between cash receipts and disbursements. TANs by state law have to be retired within the physical year in which they're issued. So the TANs that we issue for the 20 budgets will be, will be retired before the end of this fiscal year. And the ones we'll be recommending for the 21 budget will be retired by the end of 21. There is an exception in state law that says that extended maturity tax anticipation notes can be issued in case of economic distress due to natural disasters certified by FEMA or other situations identified by the comptroller. Nashville now fits into that category. And we will be exercising or will be presenting to the, to the council a request to participate in the, what we're calling FEMA TANs, those bonds that can extend over fiscal years and be paid back over two years. Our plan is to pay those back within this next budget year in FY21. But the TANs will need to be issued to help us meet the cash demands for the remainder of this year. Those total about $7 million. So with all the, the shortfalls that we've seen and the uh, revenue that we that the mayor discussed and, and the, the problem of getting to this point, we're looking at a $7 million hole that we need to fill with these extendable TANs, these extended maturity TANs that will take us into next year, but are, are in the budget to be paid off over the next fiscal year. So those are a few comments on the debt that we have uh, outstanding now and, and how we plan to carry forward with that. I'm sure there'll be many more uh, questions that come up about that and we'll be happy to answer any of those and look forward to the opportunity to discuss this further with council. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike Jameson. Thank you, Tom. Members of council, that brings us to the Q&A portion of this presentation on your WebEx screen towards the lower right, you'll see the Q&A box. For those of you that haven't already, if you'll type in your question and we'll recognize you in that order. Um, our first question uh, comes from none other than Vice Mayor Jim Shulman. I believe your microphone has been unmuted. Vice Mayor Shulman. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. Uh, and this is to Director Crumbo and you may want to pass it along to um, uh, somebody on your staff, but uh, you, you were touching on it, you started talking about the uncertainty in the economy and other things, but I guess my question is, what are the significant unknowns that influence your thinking about the budget 
And what, if anything, can be done to overcome those? Thank you, Vice Mayor Chilman, for that question. It's one that's uh, asked a lot, and not just of me, but I think of every financial officer around the country. Um, specific to us here in Davidson County, um, the biggest unknown to me at this moment really pertains to our activity taxes. And when I think about our activity taxes, that's our local option sales tax and our uh, hotel occupancy tax and so forth. And on the one hand, it's uh, easy for me to drive around downtown on my own to get reports uh, from the Convention Center Bureau, the Music City Center, and the Symphony and elsewhere, and hear that uh, they're not busy. Uh, things are you know, low activity for them, and uh, they're not sure how they're going to climb out of that. Uh, they're confident they will, but they don't know the pace. And in any given day, the information can be, you know, quite uh, conflicting. Uh, so just in the last 48 hours or so, uh, those that are country music fans would be sad, I think, to learn that the Country Music Hall of Fame is going to extend their closure all the way to the end of, of May. On the other hand, we got some really great news that the ACM awards are going to move to, to Nashville. So how that's going to play out over a period of time just in downtown and things that are very visible to us is, is largely unknown. Uh, but likewise, um, when we think about the activity that's happening downtown and uh, tourists and all that are kind of easy to spot at our airport coming and going or one thing, but what about all of us who live locally? Uh, those who would normally come down in the course of a given day that uh, really uh, are not spending money downtown or not spending money one place, are you going home and are you spending money now on Amazon? Are you spending money on um, Kroger and what have you? We just don't know the level of activity that's going to be on either side of that equation, and that leads us to the big variances and revenue forecasting. Uh, I think uh, probably a month ago now, many of you probably heard me say that uh, that number could range between 200 and 300 million just for this uh, this quarter alone. Uh, the reason for that range is what, really what I've described here. And in the early days of stay at home, where we're headed, uh, predictions were quite dire that we may be out for a very, very long time and in our homes. And so that would make the data really trend towards the higher end of that range. Uh, now that we're seeing the restrictions ease, and we're seeing uh, activities uh, start to come back, it looks like we may trend the other way. We're just not really going to know uh, for quite some time how that uh, is going to play out. Complicating that further um, in these hundreds of millions of revenues is that, um, and I think Commissioner Ely for the state said it best uh, just this last week uh, when he was talking about the sales tax and other activity receipts at the state, and he said the things that we're receiving now really pertain to revenues that were earned a couple months ago. And so things that flow from the state here are by the same token, and so we won't really be able to see that actual, actual activity till several weeks uh, still from now. So that leaves a big unknown, and so as I said earlier in my remarks, I think we need to plan for the worst, uh, we need to hope for the best, uh, but I've just got to uh, hope, along with so many other financial officers and economists, that we're going to see a trough here if we haven't already in our economic activity, and hopefully we're going to build our way out of it at some pace. The question is how big. Uh, the most recent data that I'm hearing is that we could see COVID return again, and we could have to start this all over perhaps sometime in the fall or the winter. That's a big unknown to us. And so when I think about the mayor's proposal for property taxes, which are hopefully more steady than these activity taxes, it's very meaningful to think about one really replacing the other. So those are my big unknowns. Thank you, Director Crumbo. Our next question was submitted by Councilman Bob Mendez. Councilman Mendez, we should be unmuting you on WebEx. So uh, uh, if you'll just uh, recite your question. Um, I, uh, I guess it, Two-part question. Um, uh, part one is, um, can you discuss, Kevin, the um, announcement yesterday about the uh, municipal loan uh, fund and, and whether that can help um, uh, with the operating budget? And then secondly, um, uh, I know people are wondering, I know the mayor said it, but just to reiterate, if there was uh, literally uh, no rate increase, um, what, what steps would have to be taken to uh, deal with that in the budget? 
So let me address the first question, then I'm going to ask you to clarify the, the second one. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the loan funding that you're describing, um, that is from the federal government, and I think it's probably been two weeks ago, maybe a little bit longer now. Uh, Congress uh, passed into uh, law uh, a program where there could be loans made from the federal government uh, to uh, state and local governments that had a populace of more than half a million uh, people or so. And what that really means for us here in Tennessee is that only the state would be eligible to uh, receive those funds. Uh, we just don't have some populaces here um, uh, elsewhere that would qualify the way that that was structured and once you dug into the details of it. So um, I talked this over with uh, Comptroller Wilson. Um, it didn't appear that the state wanted to be a conduit, if you will, to borrow money from the federal government and then uh, in turn to some of the local governments and um, even uh, suggested that uh, our state laws prohibit that and we'd have some other uh, problems perhaps. But uh, while that was happening, um, I was not the only one expressing that uh, we probably wouldn't be able to use those funds as they were originally laid out. Um, and so Congress has come back in the last uh, few days and tried to lower the threshold to a lower populace uh, level. And I'm just starting to receive information of that as we're preparing for this presentation. So I haven't dug into the details, but uh, that looks like it may be an opportunity for us. Uh, but here the devil is in the details. I just don't know what terms and conditions that will come with and how that will stack up relative to our other opportunities that Tom mentioned uh, with commercial paper and other forms uh, should we should we need them. So that should answer that one. And then, uh, uh, Council Mendez, I, I didn't really understand which rate you were referring to in your second part of your question, so if you could clarify that for me, it'd be great. Sure, sorry about that. Um, the question is, if the tax rate were kept flat at 315, um, what would that mean in terms of operating budget? I thought I heard, and the mayor covered a lot of things in all the slides, I thought I, I heard him say that there'd have to be mass firings or layoffs if there was going to be no rate increase. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. Oh, I understand. So I think what we're really talking about here is what what is the alternative to doing the, the rate increase? And uh, my response to that is really dollar for dollar, we would have to find the money somewhere else um, in our budget. So if we're unable to bring about um, a tax rate increase and the 300 plus million dollars are associated with that, then we need to find 300 million dollars somewhere else in the budget. And so in all likelihood, we would have to dig deeper on the things that the mayor mentioned. Um, we may need to start with discretionary spending, uh, perhaps on the nonprofits that you mentioned, perhaps other places where we have some flexibility. And then, you know, our largest expense across the metro government really has to do services we provide and the people who provide those. So much like other cities around the globe, we would probably be looking at large-scale furloughs and uh, changes to services and really uh, taking our government to what's known elsewhere as just essential services only, which would be our police, our fire, our, you know, other emergency things and things we just have to have uh, to hold um, some sort of, uh, you know, civil unrest uh, at bay. Our next question was submitted by Council Member Aaron Evans. Council Member Evans, if you can be sure to unmute, you are recognized. You hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I think Bob basically covered my question just now, Councilman Mendez, um, but I, I was really thinking about how you can get more granular related to translating the idea if the rate increase is lower or not at all, what does that really look like? So if you can um, kind of equate those dollar amounts, I know Mr. Crumbar, you just said you'd have to find 300 million. And so if there's a way for future communication to the public and down to all of us, what that would really look like, I think that would help in having conversations uh, with residents in our areas. So yeah. thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, I'd be glad to do that. Um, something that may be just useful for today is that um, I too you know, struggle giving every decimal right as we go about our business here and certainly one person me can't do it all at any given time but when I have these conversations with the mayor and some of the council people and so forth that have become you know more accustomed to uh, thinking about all things metro uh, one of the rules of thumb is that for every penny change in the rate uh, today's value of properties and so forth that translates into roughly three million dollars and so when we think about a dollar increase, uh, the simple math would be about $300 million. Um, there's actually some more decimals that we would carry that out to, and it gets a little more complicated. But hopefully that gives you a nice rule of thumb, uh, at least uh, here for today. 
Our next question comes from Council Member Tanya Hancock. Council Member Han Hancock, you have been unmuted. Great, thank you. I actually have two questions here. Can I read them both? Let's, uh, let's start with the first and see where we go. Okay. All right, so the first one was a question about the $40 million we spent on tornado recovery. And I was wondering why in the tornado recovery and, and now throughout the pandemic, we're not utilizing the Tennessee National Guard. The Guard did the recovery in Putnam and Wilson counties and we used our personnel. We were required seven days a week for our police officers. They're already shorthanded, so we paid them even more over time. And now the Guard is conducting the CD test statewide, but not here, and I was wondering why. Yeah, so um, speaking for myself, I have not been involved in those decisions about uh, public safety, so I'm glad to you know, make note of that question and then find that out for you and then follow up separately. Yes. And then my other question was um, something you had likely been involved with, and that's the um, property tax rate adjustment of $1 for USD, but it did not list the adjustment for GSD. Will that also be a dollar or will that be 87 cents? Or are they not being adjusted? Yeah. So once we get into the details of those rates, um, we did file the levies just a little bit ago. And I know that those questions can get more granular than I'm actually going to have a good knowledge base of. So um, I'm going to invite uh, Kim McDaniel uh, to the podium here. Um, she's been immersed in this topic for years and hopefully will do a better job answering that granularity than I'm able to do here on my own. So, Kim? Um, yes, the, um, if I understand the question correctly, the, the dollar increase is applied to the GSD rate. So the GSD rate will go to, would go if, if it's adopted to um, uh, $3.75 instead of the $2.75 it is now. The USD rate, there has not been a proposed increase on the USD rate. <laughs> Our next question comes from Council Member Freddie O'Connell. Councilman O'Connell, you have been unmuted. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, perfect. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mayor Cooper, Director Promo. Um, I know that there was a lot of material on the CARES Act here, and it sounds like from uh, what we just heard, we don't yet have a detailed plan. Um, as the budget is preparing, how will, if if some have anticipated restrictions are relaxed there. If we if we put together a plan, I guess a couple things. One, how is that plan and the spending going to be made transparent to council and the general public? And I guess also how will we know it's being targeted to the most vulnerable Nashvilleians right now? And then if if restrictions are relaxed, would we alter that plan so that it actually you know if we were able to use those funds in an unrestricted way uh, to um, replenish shortfalls in the general fund, would that then take us away from the plan? Has, has that been decided yet? Great. So um, you've got a lot bundled in that question. So let me see if I can uh, take those generally. And I know we're getting a little short on time here. We want to give Vice Mayor Shulman uh, a few moments to uh, wrap up here as we um, hand this presentation really over to the council and, and its processes. So uh, with respect to the CARES Fund, uh, we, just in the last few days, we have received about $121 million. And as that money's come in, I've directed that money be deposited into a segregated account uh, so that it is very clear, very transparent, uh, to use uh, that word here, um, as to what the inflows of that account will be and then consequently what will be uh, the outflows of that account. Um, I've also uh, uh, been involved recently with our Metro Audit Committee. Uh, we now have appointed a, um, a permanent internal auditor, uh, Lauren Riley, and I've had some discussions already uh, with Lauren about doing a quarterly analysis of that uh, so that there is a public transparent report uh, that how that money's coming in and where it's going. Of course, underneath all that is what I think you referred to there as the guidelines and the, the details um, of those. Really, um, there, there's not many of them yet. Uh, the guidelines that have come out um, have
have helped us already to the tune of about $26 million, um, most of that going to transit in the manner that was described uh, a little earlier. Uh, the remainder of that, uh, we're seeking clarification on the guidelines. Um, our goal is to start to uh, deploy that um, as soon as possible. But as we do that, um, I can guarantee you that will be a thoughtful process, uh, one that is a collaboration with the mayor and I'm sure resources uh, from the council and then from there into uh, the community at large. Um, it is a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, it does sit there for a little bit because uh, the original guidelines uh, actually did prohibit a few things and particularly it prohibited the replacement of lost revenues that I described. So by definition, we can't use that in the normal course of our operations. And as Mary Jo described earlier, uh, we need to use that more specifically for things related to COVID and, and a few things that extend to COVID. Uh, so I can promise you that there will be um, accountability uh, from the get-go on this. Um, I do expect that this account is going to be alive and uh, need to be managed for many years to, to come. Um, it's uh, needing to be spent, it says rather quickly, but the audit of that and how it's actually used in the future um, really could extend uh, for, for a good number of years. So I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm looking at my watch. I know we've just got about five minutes left here, so I can turn it back over to Mike uh, for closing remarks or to Vice Strollman and whatever combination you think is appropriate. Sure. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Council members, I know there were a few of you, at least three, I believe, that had additional questions. Please rest assured that as this process continues for the next two months, that the finance department and the mayor's office will be available to you uh, offline, but also during the Metro Council meetings, during discussions of the budget, budget and finance committee meetings, and the department hearings. Uh, with that, we'll turn, turn it over, over to, to Vice Mayor Shulman for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Vice Mayor Shulman. Thank you, sitting here thinking this has been so um, uh, difficult, this whole process. Uh, just amazing how much work has been put in. So I did want to thank uh, Mayor Cooper, Director Crumbo, um, and uh, uh, Ms. Wilson, and everybody's staff that has put so much effort into um, trying under extremely difficult, uh, an extremely difficult situation to figure out this budget. Um, and um, saying uh, or just commenting on something that Director Crumbo said, um, let's hope for the best, okay? We don't know what's in the future, but let's hope for the best. <clears throat> so on behalf of the Metro Council, um, we now take on the responsibility of reviewing, discussing, and working through the mayor's budget. So uh, Chairman Bob Mendes, uh, who is a chair of our um, Metro Council Budget Committee, uh, and who I have great confidence in, uh, will now take control of the process and has already sent out a budget review schedule for uh, the council. And I have confidence both in our budget committee and I have great confidence in the council as a whole that they understand the importance of this work. So we understood all along that this budget was going to be a challenge. We knew, that coming into, we knew that coming into the year, and now the challenge is so much greater. For those council members that did not get your questions answered today, as Mr. Jamison mentioned, uh, there will be plenty of time to get those addressed. For the public, we want you to be involved in these discussions as well. So um, it's the city's budget, which means that it's your budget. We're all in a very, we are all in very unique times, but we want you to be a part of reviewing the budget and providing us with feedback. You can go online or you can call us. And of course, we will be having a public hearing on the budget on Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020. And we will be practicing self, uh, safe, safe health protocols and uh, good social distancing during that public hearing. We're still working on that, but we will have a public hearing on this budget so you can be heard. We know that there will be people who have strong opinions on both sides of this budget. But in the end, after discussions and hearings and input, the council's role is to make decisions in the best interest of the people of Nashville and Davidson County. As tough as this may be and as difficult as the situation around us may be, 
We look forward to working with the mayor's office, the finance office, and the people of this great city as we work through this budget. Uh, one last thing. So all along uh, during our council meetings, I have applauded the people of Nashville and Davidson County who have practiced social distancing and have taken the steps necessary to protect themselves and their families and others from COVID-19. Keep up the great work. We have a lot of work to do in terms of this. Um, keep up the great work. And for all the people on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, the hospital workers, the caregivers, the pharmacists, the emergency personnel, the police, the firefighters, the grocers, our Metro employees, our news channels, and everyone else, thank you. We are in this together, and we will get through this together. Everyone stay safe. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov. John Cooper, who's